Today on Virginia Legends Podcast, I have Nikki Fisher, a tailback on the fabled 1990 uh, UVA team that was football team that was number one in the country um, before going to the Sugar Bowl. Uh, Nikki, thanks for joining me. Hey, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, offline, I was just saying the last time I, we saw each other, we, we both have a whole lot more hair, but Nikki was known for that for that hair. That was that was his trademark. Um, yeah, my mom was a theologian, so she felt like cutting my hair would I would lose strength. So I uh, kept growing it, kept growing it, kept growing it, and uh, never cut it. And that was actually one of the things when I went and George Wells visited the house, my mom said, "Are you going to cut his hair?" And he said, "No, no, he doesn't have to cut his hair." <laughs> That's great. So there yeah. it was. Well, you had you had a lot of strength. So, uh, well, let me let me reintroduce you to people. Um, you are uh, you're from Martinsville, Virginia, which is the southern southern part of Virginia, known for their great basketball and for their uh, uh, stock car racing. Um, Eighty eight grad yeah. in Mar Martinsville High School uh, went to, went to UVA uh, again. Was a had four great years at UVA. Uh, still one of the leading uh, average uh, rushes per carry in UVA history. Scored ten touchdowns and led the team uh, that 1990 season. And then it was the 10th round draft choice uh, for the Chicago Bears. So did I get the uh, broad strokes right there, Nikki? Yeah, you sure Yeah, sure did. You sure did. That was some good years. Oh, man, they were, they were, that was a great year. Um, and uh, I was just wondering, do, yeah. do, people, do people still stop you in the street and ask you about that team? And, or is that, is, that, is that season the season you think about often? I, yeah, you know, um, one, there's people that do ask me about the season um, a lot. Uh, down here where I live, you know, uh, Virginia is not so not so loved uh, um, or well recognized, but we do have a lot of people that come from Virginia down to Wilmington, North Carolina, and I work specifically in Wrightsville Beach, uh, North Carolina. So there's a lot of vacationers that come to the beach, and I work on a resort there, so there's a lot of Virginians that come down to North Carolina. But yeah, they do ask about the 90 season, and then most recently with the uh, who's number one um, documentary that was uh, on TV. Um, there's a lot more questions about that season, but yeah, I think about it. I, I I don't think I think there's probably a week or two weeks that go by that uh, that I'm a memory comes back of that season. Yeah, Wilmington's a beautiful city. Uh, you're, you're very lucky to live there. But let's go to um another great another great town, Martinsville. Uh, Martinsville, Virginia. My, my father's from Bedford, not that far from uh, away. Um, oh but, yeah, yeah. But M Martinsville is known for its great basketball. They have a a, fa a famous basketball coach there named Husky Hall uh, that won so yeah. many state champions. Produced uh, uh, players like Jeff Atkins played in Maryland. Uh, well, Sean Sean Moore played basketball. Uh, Mark Cook, I think, was a couple of years ahead of you. Was was a great player. Tony Dallas. Yeah. Uh, just so uh, mm -hmm. so many great basketball programs. Um, is Martinsville also known for its football? I, I wasn't aware of that. Yeah. Yeah, we are. We are known for our football. Um, you know, prior to me moving to Martinsville, um, I moved to Martinsville in the sixth grade. And all I heard was about the football team, football team, football team, football team. Um, and then they were going through a great, great run at that time with, uh, you know, Tony Dallas and all those guys. Um, Prior to me, I never actually got to meet Tony Dallas, but um, um, they were having a great run with Husky Hall and state championship runs and state championship wins um, when I was in the sixth grade around that time. And then, you know, when I got to high school, of course, Martinsville um, went on to 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 uh, to state with uh, Sean Moore on the team, Mark Cook, uh, Frank B. Uh, 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 Kevin Beamer, sorry, not Frank Beamer, Kevin Beamer. There was a lot of great athletes that uh, was on that team um, and uh, phenomenal. I, I, I remember going to basketball games in seventh grade and just seeing seeing guys that were just elevating a way, <laughs> way higher than I ever could imagine in, uh, in a little basketball uh, court uh, um, that we had. Was football in the shadow of basketball in Martinsville? Now, I know GW Danville is more of a football town. Her, uh, Herm, Herman Moore and 
Uh, what were the brothers that played that, that came out of there? But they, they, Danville's known for football. So what about what about Martinsville? Yeah, you know what um, basketball was? It was uh, a strong point um, because they were they were they were going every, almost every year going to state. But um, football wise, there were some great athletes that were had played at um, played in high school, and we were uh, you know in contingent every year. Um, Bulldog Martinsville Bulldogs were always in, uh, going to state or regional. Um, championships are are playing in those games so you know my my uh senior year we went to state um the next following year we won state um so we we lost a tab um in in kirby and slade and that that crew um my senior year but uh you know um the following year we won state so yeah we were athletically Martinsville was doing very well for itself um uh football and basketball yeah well you mentioned your mother earlier and I went back and looked at some old articles and even back at, at UVA you would mention your mother often to the to the press so you guys were really tight uh, did you was, was your mother an athlete and did, did she get you into sports um she wasn't um she said she did play basketball um but she wasn't like a um you know all in to athletics i think where my mom came from and and where she grew up i think uh athletics kind of was put, put to the side because of all the work that had to be done she was in a household full of uh of of kids as well um a family of 10 she had uh four four sisters and five brothers so if you can imagine um there was a lot of work to be done so she didn't get to play as much but she loved the game she picked up the game um um, she learned as well because she wasn't, you know, all into football, um, baseball, um, which was another sport that I, I played a lot before I came to Martinsville. And then um, she got into track because uh, track was, was a big love of mine as well. Uh, I think that started my 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 love uh, of running um, was being on the track team and uh, um, running around Ferrum. Um, because that's where we moved from um, being around all the athletes there from lacrosse being a water boy for the lacrosse team, the women's softball team, um, the football team, of course, running to get the tees after the kickoffs and hanging around with uh, Hank Norton and uh, all the coaches that came out of there uh, with Virginia Tech and Maryland, uh, Coach Zernhill, Coach Almation, who coached at UVA, Coach uh, Zernhill coached at the uh, University of Maryland. Um, all of those guys I wound up running into or being coached by in college. So uh, it was a good start for me from Ferrum to Martinsville going to that hotbed of athletics. Yeah, you got to Ferrum a little bit before my my high school classmate, Chris Warren, uh, uh, got there. So why do, why do you think yeah. there's so many great athletes and teams from the Martinsville Bill Dale, uh, Jury Mason, uh, I forgot those little towns. Why are there yeah. so many great teams and athletes from that area? You know, I, I don't, don't know. I, I will say that there's a strong emphasis on sport there. Um, there is a lot of um, a legacy and living up to that legacy. I, I know that when, when I moved there, um, Dennis Mahan, all I could, all I heard over and over again was about this great running back that they had, Dennis Mahan, mm -hmm. and I never got to meet him. But um, you know, just hearing about how he used to run, how tough, tough he was, and just a beast of a running back he was um, over the years, that was somebody that um, I wanted to be, even though I never got to meet him or see him run. Um, just kind of living up to that legacy was something I was trying to do um, all along. Yeah. Well, you, you grew up in a time with some great running backs on TV. So who were your first heroes? I, I think Walter Payton was probably doing his thing about that time. Uh, Greg Pruitt, there was, there was lots, uh, every, Tony Dorsett. There, um, every team had a, had a star tailback at the time. Who, who were your first uh, uh, role models? Oh, I'd say Walter Payton. Definitely. Um, I would say, uh, you know, this is gonna be this is gonna sound funny, but um, John Riggins, yeah, my mom loved 
John Riggins. We were Washington Redskins fans um, from the, the jump. And uh, my mom loves some John Riggins. I, I think it was the way he was being brash and and the way he ran. He was just tough and he just didn't he had he just didn't care attitude. Um, and my mom just was <laughs> just loved him to death. And then Walter Payton, we just fell in love with as uh, as I got to high school. And, uh, you know, there was, a, there was a lot of great running backs at that time. So there was a lot of people to kind of, you know, uh, emulate and want to be. Yeah. People forget, I mean, you, you were a really fast runner. People forget John Riggins was a 100-meter dash runner when he was young. But we tend to, we t- we tend to remember him from his older days when he was more of a, of a power uh, fullback. Um, but anyway. Yeah, you, it's definitely. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, def- yeah definitely. Um, you know, um, Riggins ran like a 4-4. Um, 40 he was extremely fast that's a funny thing people you, you, I'm glad you brought that up because when I bring up like he was one of my favorite runners I, I, I remind him of I say go back and look at him at the Jets and see how he's uh, you know the film is a little different but look how he's separating himself from DBs even even back then but Riggins was one of my favorite but Walter Payton was probably the the GOAT yeah, exactly Riggins, like like you, was a five yard runner, five yard average per carry his rookie year. But then he again, he got. I think he had some injuries and he changed, kind of changed his style. But you, you mentioned the Martinsville football program. Yeah. Who was the coach there? And was he was he a coach of a big reputation like Husky Hall? Yeah, yeah, he definitely did. He had a great reputation. His name was uh, Coach Taylor Edwards, and uh, he uh, picked up. Uh, 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 you know, he was part of a legacy as well. Um, um, th- there was coaches before him that were phenomenal, and he just picked up where they left off. And uh, we had so, we had some great runs. We 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 had some phenomenal runs with Sean. We were uh, regional finals, uh, almost made it to state that uh, with Sean at quarterback. Um, we. Following him, we had Tony Scales who went on to play at BMI, um, and he took us to the state championship game. Um, we've had we had some very good athletes, and and uh, Taylor Edwards was uh, great at mentoring. And I still I talked to him probably about six months ago, um, and he just he was just a good guy. He, he coached you well. He uh, played to your strengths, uh, never belittled you, and. Um, he was just an overall good coach, good guy. Yeah. What was, what was the style of offense you guys ran? It was an eye. Uh, oh, okay. Um, we did an eye uh, backfield. Yeah. It was a, a – we slammed it. We slammed it hard. Um, it was one of those where you knew – probably most of the teams knew it was coming, um, but it was it was hard to stop it. Yeah, you're running, you're running downhill, and then it's pretty tough. Well, you, you mentioned running – you mentioned um, playing against Tab, and Tab yeah. – uh, Obviously, uh, Terry Kirby came to UVA a year after you. Um, yeah, and he was a, also a basketball star at Tab as, as well. Um, did you? Did you guys? Uh, and then you know, at UVA there was a rivalry for for playing time there. Um, yeah. Did, did you guys have any inclination at the time that you guys would be college teammates? We didn't. We didn't. We really didn't. I. You know, there's probably. Um, I don't even. You know, even when we were. At, uh, we, we met on field at the, the state championship game. It was just a quick, uh, you know, slap, mm-hmm. slapping of hands and uh, moving forward. I, uh, we, we really never got together prior to that time. And then when he came on campus or uh, uh, arrived on campus, we were, um, we were really just, uh, our friendship was, I think at the very beginning, I think it was really tough um, because of course, as you just said, and you make it very clear, is that we did have a rivalry in in trying to uh, to start and, tr- and trying to run that ball um, and try to have our, our time with uh, with uh, being on the first team. So it was um, it was tough at first, but we worked through it. And as I've said before, I never, I don't even think we had cross words in the four years that we were there. Um, I think a lot of people played into that and 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 pop propped it up for us, but and it made it more of an issue than what it was. But overall, you know, we both just wanted to play, and and I certainly did vocalize or uh, verbalize that I I wanted to play. Yeah, well, George, George Welsh often had um, 
a crowded backfield, and he liked to rotate his running backs. Uh, do you believe that a running back, especially you in particular, you're better off with more carries, or do you think when you're platooned, you're fresher for the carries that you get? Um, I think you you know, I think platooning um, works well. I think for me, the more carries I get in a game, the more comfortable I feel. And, you know, if you get me by the fourth quarter, third quarter, um, and, and we're on a roll and everybody, everything's clicking, it's, 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 it, to me, it was, it was, it was over because the com- me being comfortable in the backfield, me being comfortable with what we're, our, our scheme is, um, as we continue to, even if we had to pound it out, like one yard at a time, it just, it just felt more and more comfortable to me that we were going to break something open at some point in time um, and get big yards and, and make something happen. But Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday, you, you probably felt more beat up if you were getting more carries. So did you ever, even, even though you felt more comfortable and you get, you have more confidence because you know, the ball was coming to you. Um, is part of you though, uh, are you glad you didn't have to take such a beating and have that that many carries when you're in college? Um, yes and no, no. But um, I, I you know, all of us would want as many carries as one. I, 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 as we can get. Um, that's the way I felt about it. Yeah. Um, bring it on. Um, I wanted to 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 be out there. I wanted to play. I, I, I can get in the ice on Monday and Tuesday, Sunday. Uh, start Sunday <laughs> with the ice on <laughs> Sunday, Monday uh, and Tuesday. And we kind of hit during the week, but we didn't hit as much as some teams uh, that we had heard about. Um, we had some light days. Um, they took, they took real good care of us um, in terms of week to week and game to game. Yeah. So did you, did you consider other schools? I know your, your mother liked George Ross because she, she assured her, her that he wouldn't cut your hair. But uh, where all, what other schools did you consider? I know at the time UNC was doing a lot of recruiting in Virginia. So, and, and it's close to Martinsville. Yeah, yeah, I did. I, yeah, I went on a recruiting visit at, at, uh, in Chapel Hill. And, um, you know, I, I quickly realized that what I was getting myself into, uh, I think he, uh, uh, Mark was it Mark May at quarterback at the time. Um, they had a huge quarterback. I remember just seeing him come on the field. When I was in the tunnel at uh, Chapel Hill and seeing him come through the tunnel with a uh, offensive line, uh, a lineman. Um, the two captains were coming on the field and I don't know who the captain was, but I remember looking at the quarterback and going, Oh my God, he's absolutely huge. I was like, these guys are, you know, are they're not pro. This this is college. You need to get your games. You need to get yourself together. And I remember saying that when I saw um, the quarterback come through with the lineman. But I remember, I think May was like six six, six seven, or something like that, a quarterback. But um, that was just a freak of nature. But anyway, that was just the thing I remember. Um, yeah, I went to several different schools, NC State. Um, um, went up to Maryland just briefly, but my official visits were Purdue and Virginia. Um, those were my two official visits, and um, I had gone to all the other schools kind of on my own, own um, or through um, just quasi visits. When my friends was going to camp or something like that, I had uh, I would go up there and, and just kind of visit on my own as we pick them up. Um, that's how I went to NC State to. to kind of do an unofficial visit there. Um, but those were the two schools that I really had my official visits. I was pretty much knew where I wanted to go. Uh, I just had to make that final decision. And I went to Purdue um, on a visit and and it was sleeting and, and freezing. And I think it was like 20 degrees and I made a decision right there. This is too cold out here in this Midwest. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I, I made a decision uh, on Virginia. Oh, was it was it an adjustment going for work working class uh, uh, Martinsville to to UVA Charlottesville College Town? Was it a was it a social adjustment? Yeah, for you? Absolutely. absolutely, absolutely. It was definitely a social adjustment. Um, oh, <clears throat> just to, to put it plainly and frankly, um, we were we were not wealthy uh, at all, um, and we struggled paycheck to paycheck. And but. Um, 
a lot of kids didn't know that. Um, when I, got, I hit UVA, um, I got several comments uh, on the on the fact that um, people were like, "Oh, you must have money," or "You uh, you, you sound like you have money," or something like that. I guess it's because of my vocabulary, whatever. But um, <laughs> I had negatives like five hundred dollars in the, the bank at that point in time when they're saying this. And I'm like, no, there's <laughs> there's no money coming here. Um, but it was definitely a social adjustment. Um, um, I didn't want to join a fraternity there um, as well. That was a social adjustment. Um, and just getting it to know that it was a, it was a school full of a lot of wealthy kids. Um, and uh, fitting in was uh, one of those things that you had to do. Yeah. So I went to UVA between 88 and 84 and 88. I was an 88 grad. And then I went to law school for the 91 and I saw the transition. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I was there and I saw the transition. UVA became uh, in the black community. I felt like money and status didn't mean as much when we first got there. By the time it was 91, a different world was on TV. It was kind of like uh, people wanted to drive the nice car uh, that, um, in terms of the, um, uh, the black community. Uh, you know, you know, if, if you had some money and you, and you showed it off, uh, that was a good thing. And I felt that that kind of happened during my seven years there. I didn't feel that way when I first got to UVA. Yeah, I, you def you're definitely right. There was, uh, you know, they had uh, the Cosby show. Um, they had, uh, like you just said, a couple of other shows on, on TV. They were kind of talking about the college experience for black people. And, um, you know, it, initially I remember going, wow, I wish I had those clothes. Those, those kids are in college, um, you know, and just looking at their styles and the way they're dressed and everything like that. Um, I think that kind of morphed itself and onto the UVA campus over the, over those four years I was there. Um, certainly at the beginning wasn't as, as much, but as you saw those, those, uh, those shows on TV, they kind of brought themselves to the campus. We also had, you know, a, a lot of those, uh, uh, those shows that were close by. Um, the comedy uh, show that I forgot what it is but off the top of my head. Why did I forget that show? Um, that was on BET um, for a long time. They had a couple stints and played at uh, in, live, in, in Living Hall. Color. In um, Living Color? No. Not, not in, in Living, living color. color. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Well, they, they had a common deaf, com uh, deaf comedy jam. I don't know if you remember that, but that also played at UVA too. So a lot of those. Um, young men that uh, that were at UVA were able to bring that experience to the campus and it changed a lot it really did you're right you're right it did change a lot over the years yeah it changed right in front of me how about race relations Martinsville is very much a southern town that was those were that was the area of, of the big farms and uh, historically and it was, it was a southern town and then you're in Charlottesville was also kind of a southern southern city at the time um, what, what, what were the relative race relations in, in Martinsville, Martinsville compared to Charlottesville? I mean, did you have a lot of white friends in, in Martinsville? Um, I did. And that was, was a, it was a little odd. Um, my uh, high school experience was uh, um, when we moved to Martinsville, my mom, we moved almost squarely downtown um in a downtown area we were like a block from the main downtown so our house uh was right and let me let me it's really difficult sometimes talking about this because i've talked to people about this experience there is in martinsville at that time there was definitely a black side of town and there was definitely a white side of town there's no other way to kind of say it um there was a, a street called Fayette Street, and then there was a Mulberry, um, per se. I was smack dab between Fayette Street and Mulberry. Mm -hmm. And Fayette Street was the black side of town. Mulberry was the white side of town with the country club at the end of the street, the, the long street. Um, and the, there wasn't too many crossings of those activities and me being smack dab in the middle moving from Farm, where I was primarily the only kid from kindergarten to sixth grade I was the only black kid in the school hmm. um so my aspects of race 
were were completely different. I was I was uh, experiencing some different race uh, uh, issues at Ferrum, but they weren't to the degree that say a person in Martinsville was in the, at the same age, same time, and um, and same color. So when I got to Martinsville, it was definitely a transition for me to go to a middle school that was, I want to say 70%, 65%, 70% black at that time. Um, it was, uh, and it was in the black neighborhood. Um, so, you know, there was uh, options for uh, other kids uh, the white kids in the neighbor in the in in the city as well to go to different schools. Um, there was a Carlisle um, that was a, another school, a prep school um, that other kids could go to as well. So, um, yeah, it was it was it was navigating those. Uh, that was a little little hard for me. It was. But you but you had you had friends with with, with white kids down there, and then did you at QVA? I remember I came from Northern Virginia and. Um, even though most of my closest friends were black when I was in high school, uh, there wasn't that many of us. So uh, we were friends with everybody. It was, it was, it was yeah. for the time, pretty progressive. Yeah. When I went to UVA, yeah. it was the first time that most of my friends were black because the black community at UVA was very insular. It's very vibrant. And uh, mm -hmm. so my, my, my social uh, life changed dramatically the other, the other way. It became um, more with, with the black community. Well, how, what, what about you? How, how did your life change at UVA? Or did, were you hanging mostly with the athletes and it was a little bit you know, it was, it, you know, at the beginning, it was mainly with the athletes and the, all my, you know, my, I had a couple roommates and then in my second year, my roommates, they were all white and um, those relationships grew and grew and grew. And I found myself down rugby road a lot. Um, and as a part of being down rugby road, there's a lot, a lot of white fraternities Um and I grew those relationships and, and uh, wound up joining a frat in my second year. Uh, this was probably a reason for that was I was trying to find some way to, 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 to get away um, because I was around a lot of athletes a lot. My mom did push sports, but she, she wasn't, as I explained, she was learning as well. But she always pushed the education. She was definitely an education. She, she's a person who went back to school when she was 37 years old. Um, went back to Fairham College and spent four and a half years getting a degree um, in theology as well as psychology. And so, you know, dropped everything. We moved that when I was six years old. So uh, education was important to her much more than running a football up and down the field. So yeah, I, I joined a fraternity at that point and um, it was Delta Sigma Phi and those guys brought me in and and I never saw race um, at that point. Um, they never made me feel that way. There was there, there was certainly fraternities that were across the street adjacent next to us <laughs> that, you know, my frat was like, you, you don't want to go there. You don't want to go in there. You don't want to hang there. Uh, um, and the reasons being because they would never accept a, a, a African American um, in their fraternity, um, or you know, you, you don't want to hang with the sorority because of that reason. Those are the things that, um, even with being an athlete on campus, you realize and you quickly uh, you you quickly adjust. Yeah, um, and and also there was like. I think mostly um, the athletes were the black students that were the most accepted at Rugby Road. I thought the, the average black students weren't really accepted in, mo in most places. Did you feel any blowback from the black community? Yes. When you, did you did you feel any blowback from the black community when you joined a white fraternity? Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm glad you asked the question because that would have been an elephant in the room. Um, <laughs> you know, um, th th yeah, definitely I did. Um, but I, I will tell you, Julian, I. I, I had experienced that for most of my life. Like I said, kindergarten through sixth grade, um, but only black kid at Farum Elementary. Um, uh, there might have been there. I think there was a professor at Farum that had a, another child, but they were well, a couple years younger or three years younger than I was. Um, but uh, being called a white boy um, was was 
something I was used to at that point. Um, and when I got to UVA, it didn't stop. Um, it, it was something that was joked about. Um, but, and, but I, I knew where it was coming from, but I knew what, you know, I, I knew I had a black mother. I knew I had a huge black family that was very supportive of me. And, um, we just, we, we just, I just came up differently. I, I really did. I came up differently. Um, when I say hey, we moved from the Eastern shore of Virginia, where all our family was, and, you know, we were, we were not rich. Like I said, we were, we were really poor. And my mom just said, this has got to be a better way. And we moved when she was 37 to Ferrum. She got education on campus. And um, that was the best experience of, of my entire mm -hmm. life. And, and fortunately or unfortunately, whether, whatever way you want to look at it, I think of it fortunately because it, it broadened me is that most of those people on Ferrum campus were, were white. Um, they helped. Um, they were very supportive. And to this day, I, I thank them for the life-changing experience I had. And then when I went to UVA, to me, it was, it was very similar. Um, I think it was more uh, in your face at that point. Um, and you could see it a little bit differently, but I, I understood a little bit better at that point. You say in your face, you mean... Um... Black students who didn't appreciate you joining a white fraternity or the or, or white students who were racist because you're uh, African American? Well, both. Um, you know, there was there was there was some feed there was some feedback. <laughs> if that's the word I want to use, there was some feedback from me joining a, a white fraternity, but there was also some feedback um um in in from white students as well. Um there were comments. Um especially if you're in a, a white fraternity and then you go to another fraternity that is predominantly are all white. Um, there, who is this guy? Um, a lot of times, though, you're right on the sense that being an athlete, you kind of break down those those barriers. Yeah. Um, and we certainly did. We certainly did. We broke down. I, I want to say even the basketball team, the football team, uh, at that time, broke down a lot of barriers. There was nowhere that uh, anyone did not go on either side, um, whether it was white or black. And there was great relations uh, amongst uh, all of us, uh, you know, the white kids on the white uh, players, uh, athletes on the basketball team, as well as the uh, white players on the football team. Uh, everyone got along. I, I don't remember there being any issue at all at UVA with the athletes, but we knew how strong the racism, the, 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 it, I guess what you call institutional racism was um, and what where it was lying at that point. Well, the athletes certainly broke down a lot of barriers as, as to with the women. So we, we know that, we know that for anyone who went to UVA, <laughs> any, anyone who went to UVA remember, remembers that. Well, well let's, let's, uh, let's go, to, uh, let's, let's get to the football field. And unlike, yeah. a, lot, unlike a lot of students, you hit the ground running in terms of you didn't redshirt. Um, Back then, UVA redshirted a lot of their, a lot of the, even the best athletes because yeah. they wanted to, you know, get them stronger, get them acclimated to school. But you jumped in in, in the first year. First year, uh, Marcus Wilson was the lead runner, but there wasn't a lot. We didn't get a lot of rushing yards, and the, and the yards were distributed pretty evenly. You were the second um, highest rusher. Um, tell us a little bit about your first year and the transition to ACC football. Um, it was it was slow and methodical. You know, like you said, there was a. Uh... There was a lot of um, a lot of the athletes redshirted. I was the only one that uh, freshman that came in that played that year. Um, out of all the freshmen that came in and, and walk-ons, um, and I started the last four. I think it was the last four games of the season. We had Marcus Wilson. He went down. Um, backup went down. We had a fullback that went down. We had a lot of injuries at that point. Um, and I, I had my first start against North Carolina. I, I want to say that was the eighth game of the season or something like that. Um, but I played sporadically and had some um, some good touches um, up until that point, some good experience. But um, being put into that role uh, towards, I think, the eighth game of the season, was it was like, wow. Here we go. Here we go. But at the same time, I was worried about losing my red shirt because all, all my all my friends and all my uh, fellow uh, teammates that came in, uh, you know, no one else 
I was losing the red shirt and I was going to be losing mine towards the end of the season. So, but it was, it was all for the team and I was excited. And uh, that adjustment came very quick um, early in the season because of the touches I had. So getting, being on the field um, wasn't so uh, tough and we wound up being very successful towards it the end of that season. You know, when you, when you first start running, um, it, it's got to be overwhelming, the, the adjustment to big time college football. And then, you know, as a fourth year <clears throat> and third year, and you average, you know, seven and five yards a carry. What was the biggest difference in you as a first year where it was harder to get those kind of yards? What, what, what is an adjustment a running back has to go through in, in big time college football? I think, you know, <clears throat> um, it's kind of like when I turned pro, one of the guys, told me he was like this game is more um um more mental development. and I, I didn't understand that I didn't understand it at all um and then it, it came to me as you're on the field and you're thinking about everything that you're doing um instead of just doing it you're slow um when I came in as a freshman I was thinking about everything I was worried about the pads I had on did I have enough pads on was it going to get hurt? You know, all these types of things you think about as a freshman. Um, and, and then as the game slowed down, as the plays became easier, as I was able to read defenses and pick up uh, inclinations of, a, of what's going to happen, um, things slow down. And when the game slows down for you, that's when you become faster. That's when you're not thinking about what you're doing and you're just doing it. Um, and it becomes rote. Um and, and it becomes easier for everybody, yourself uh, included. And that's what I think I, I got towards the, my freshman year when I, when I touched the ball, like a couple first of the game, first two games, just, just had some plays. And then to the part where I started, it was um, um, things became a lot easier. It just flowed. When you first started getting in the game, how did it change your status around, out, around ground? When you walk around with people, uh, talk to you, comment, and a you know, nice game. Does, does it change things when you finally start to play? Yeah, it did. It, it did change things. I mean, you start to – you you kind of walk with a little bit more of a elevation in your <laughs> step. And, and um, you, you know, it's not an arrogance. It's not – and certainly for me, it wasn't arrogance. Um, I was – I'm one of those kids that one step – took the pads off you probably never even knew I played football except for my size because I was just in so many different things and I wasn't I, I, I wasn't a sneaker head I wasn't a, a football head even to this day I'm not any of those things some people ask me about games and stuff like that and I'm like yeah I saw it over the last two minutes of the game just like you you know <laughs> I'm watching sports center at the end of the evening to catch up on all the games um, I'm not in front of it while it's actually happened because of my my career over the years but um, yeah I you know football when when you're when you get that ball um, as a freshman um, and then after you start and you're on the field you do walk around with a little bit more more and, and then people set an expectation for yourself. You know, they set these expectations once you get out there that um, you're going to continue to do well and they're supportive. And that's what I got. I got, I, I think that's the main thing. That's why I got so excited about that is the expectation that was set. Um, yeah, you can do this and you believe it. And do you get more respect from the, your teammates and, your, and the coaching staff when you're actually yeah. playing a lot? Yeah, I, you know, yeah, I did. Um, you know, the, the first two games I got um, first uh, 100 yard games back to back since Barry Word. And that mm -hmm. was that was consistently. I mean, he's, it's in all when you, if you go back and look at the media guides, that's one of the things that they they write about um, since Barry Word. Mm -hmm. um, that was kind of big to me because when I was on visits going to the campus and seeing him play, um, man, Barry Word, whoo, yeah. man. I tell you, uh, him and Chris, um, those are two players that I just looked at and we were like, oh, my God, if I could do half of what they do, I'm going to be OK. I'm going to be OK. They, the way they ran the football, um, their strides, uh, very word stride to this day, being a big guy as a freshman, not maybe not so much as at Kansas City, 
but being a freshman at UVA, being uh, through his years running the ball, his stride was unbelievable, unbelievable. He was power. He was speed. He was he was the whole package. Yeah. Well, so your your second year, you, you had to be very optimistic going into the year after the way you finished your first year. But Marcus Wilson was back and he was healthy, and then Terry Kirby from Tab uh, enters the mix. Um, you know the team opens up another name, loses, but has a big win. Um, at Penn State, um, I think next week or the week after, and then had a big yep. one over in, NC State. Um, tell us about, about about your second year. It had to be kind of a um, a mixed bag, and you had some some nice moments, but um, you probably expected a, a little bit more your second year. Yeah, I did. I did expect a little bit more. Um, I also kind of entered that 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 time period with uh, um, with an injury. I had a bone spur. Um, oh that I, in, in the spring season, I was in a walking cast for six, eight months, six months. I want to say it was around that time. Oh, it was four to six months. I'm sorry. Um, so I was in a walking cast for that and they couldn't, they couldn't figure out what the heck was going on. Um, I think the overall thing was, it was uh, a gout. Mm. I had gout in my foot mm. and people were thinking, you know, of gout being an old person that I did at that time. I thought gout being an old person's disease or something like that um, or condition and didn't really know too much about it. But saying you have gout was kind of like saying you have a, <laughs> you just broke a nail or something. It hurt. It literally hurt. And uh, especially when we're playing on the AstroTurf, if you remember as well, that was a little tough having a, a, a a problem with your toes or your feet or anything like that. Um, and so I started out really slow and then wanted to play and wanted to be in the game. And, and uh, you know, some things changed that second year, definitely for sure. Well, you know, you, we end up uh, getting to the Citrus Bowl. So it was great. It was great for the, uh, the team, but we lose yep. to Illinois. Um, and then the next year is obviously the year 1990 was the, you know, incredible year where we, we finally beat Clemson. Um, you know, we we were undefeated, number one in the country. And you have an unbelievable year, one of the one of the best uh, years uh, of any run, UVA running back has ever had in terms of yards per carry. You had 848 yards, seven yards of carry, 10 rushing TDs. Um, were you healthy going into the year? And, and did you know, despite the fact that Kirby was was there, it was, it was going to be your year? Yeah, you know, I didn't know. Um, I didn't know what was going to happen um playing time wise uh, um uh, because of the retrospect into what happened the second year marcus um decided that he was going to leave early and um uh, when it, they went to the nfl um which was a, you know he had another year so he had a choice that he could have made and stayed and played but i think uh I think we were both in the in kind of the same position that, that in, in terms of are we going to play? Will we play? What what is the word? And uh, as you may or may not know, um, and I, I shared this with uh, uh, Tony Covington um, a couple weeks ago or more, uh, a couple several months ago, that I did. You know, we my mom came up to the school and and we approached the situation that. Um, I was thinking about transferring, um, and we we did it privately. We did we didn't make a big deal about it, but it was it was a meeting, and um, some things were talked about. I mean, one of the things was my mom, as she always said, you know, you're not going to get a degree in football, but um, she also made it clear to them that I had a talent and I wanted to play, and and the conversation went went well. And but you just never know. Um, and at that time, there was no portal um, and uh, um, there was no way for me to leave at that point. Are you glad there wasn't a portal and you had to you had to kind of stick it out or sit out a year? I'm glad, you know, in looking at in life experiences um, and gaining strength from things um, that you go through. Yes, I'm glad I stayed. I'm glad uh, it worked out. Um, we had a phenomenal year um, that that following year, um, and 
it was uh, working together. If you look at any of the film, look at any of the things that we were doing, there was no one that was uh, not excited about how we were playing, um, Terry or, or I. Um, and we worked well together uh, in that that dynamic and uh, racked up some yards and did really well um, for the team. What are some of your favorite highlights from that year? I mean, as a team, obviously beating uh, Clemson was historic um, and being number one is historic. But personally, I mean, you had you had so many good runs that year. What are some of your your, your highlights that you that you look back on fondly? I, you know, I look back on uh, the Clemson game. That was was huge. Um, I remember uh, one of the runs there. That was phenomenal. Um, for me, it was a closure to the game um, and breaking uh, breaking a, like a 30-yard run towards the end of the game to kind of seal it. Um, to uh, it didn't make a touchdown or anything like that, but uh, I remember heading to the sideline and after this run and broke it to uh, to the left and came down down the sideline and wound up on the sideline and jumped up in excitement, but I was over where the Clemson side was. And as I said, never one to really kind of put it in your face ever. I realized where I was and kind of muted my celebration somewhat. But that was a play that I was like, one, I was on the field. They trust me enough to have me on the field at that point. Um, and then to break that run um, to kind of you know put the nail in, nail in it was – was something I will never forget after 20 years of not winning against Clemson. Uh, that was, that was something phenomenal. Yeah. One of the strangest uh, sporting events I've ever been to was the Georgia tech game. Uh, I, I remember the game. Yeah. I, I was there as, just as a student watching the game and it, yeah. we controlled the first half and it, we were off to another big victory and there was no doubt we we're winning this game. And, you know, as I talked to Jason Wallace about this, you know, the breaks didn't seem to go our way. We had some strange plays happen. But my, my strongest memory of the game was when it was over. And I have never been in a stadium so quiet. I remember leaving, and it, uh, it was the state of shock and quietness in the, in, the, in the stadium. It was still packed. Everyone stayed to the very end. I'll never forget that moment leaving the, leaving the quiet stadium. What, do you, what are your memories of, of that day? Oh, man. Um, I've – I've uh... – that game, I I think I just compartmentalized that whole game immediately afterwards and just shut down. I think I was probably like everybody else in the stadium. Um, and I think it was the same for a lot of our our our, our players and and our coaches as well. It was it was a shock. Um, it was a it was a phenomenal game. It was a tough game. Um, a hard hitting game. Um, but there were some things that happened, you know, specifically for me, um, that I didn't quite get over. And to be honest with you, Julian, it, I, I've talked to, to several players most recently, um, one being Tony, um, Covington, and, uh, I expressed that very thing. It probably took me 30 years to get over um, missing that pass um, because to me, and probably every player feels this way, whether you jump off sides in a critical play, which we had that happen. Um, we had some other things happen, uh, uh, you know, a um, uh, you know, uh, kickball out of Sean's hand. Um, that was really weird. That was a turnover. Um, we, we had we had some really strange things happen in that second half. But um, one for me, I felt like the whole, and and this is just somebody that takes a lot of things on their shoulders, and 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 holds a lot of accountability. I felt like you know when I missed that pass, um, the game changed, um, the momentum of the game changed. Nikki, I don't remember that that play. What, what was what was the pass? What was what was the context? Um, yeah, it was uh, Sean came. Uh, Sean was in the. Um, kind of sprint it to the left or to sprint to the right. And then I was on the opposite side of the field. I, I really believe that um, I could be wrong. And a pass came across the field and it uh, went through my hands and bounced off my, uh, my uh, visor. And um, it was a turnover bounce up into the hands of the Georgia tech player. He ran it back down the field to about the 40, I believe it was. Um, 
that was it. That was a play that I felt like changed some of the momentum to, of the game. Mm. And to be honest with you, I, I took a, a lot of that that on my shoulders as as being responsible, even though I've had reporters and people over the years come to me and say, do you remember this? Do you remember that? But these are other plays that happened in a game that, that changed the, 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 the outcome. And I had just internalized it myself um, as that was one play that changed the entire game. Uh, but that's what sometimes you do as an athlete. And you can't, you can't do that. You can't do that. Right. Well, you know, it was, it was a it was a horrible uh, horrible loss in terms of uh, I mean, you guys had a great team, but but you know we were ahead. But sometimes you do lose. But we were able we mm-hmm. were able to bounce back with a nice win on the road in, at UNC. So that must yeah. have felt it must have felt good to get back on the bike and, and win the next game. Yeah, it was it was great, and um, you know everybody came together and and did a good job. Uh, I think they were still. We're still kind of – all of us, we're still thinking about it at Georgia State. I don't think anyone had that game out of their mind for the rest of the season. Yeah. But, yeah, the bounce back was good. Uh, coaching um, focused us um, to the next week, and we moved on. Yeah. Did, was the rest of the season – I mean, you know, we ended up losing to Maryland, another heartbreaking loss. Sean gets hurt mm-hmm. also. And we had a horrible game against – we had a horrible game against Virginia Tech. Um, mm-hmm. But then we, you know, back then the bowl bids went out early. So, you know, we got the sugar bowl bid, which was nice. Um, mm-hmm. what, what, what were your, your uh, memories of the late part of that season? And was it, was it made sweeter by the fact that we were able to get a, a New Year's Day bowl game? Yeah, it was, it was sweeter because of that. I think uh, um, towards those, those last couple of games that we had, um, there was a, a lot of, uh, you know, losing to Virginia Tech is never a good thing. Mm-hmm ever <laughs> and so that was very disappointing especially with the season that we had um the hype that was going into being number one in the country and then knowing that we were ha- going to have virginia tech at the end of the season and uh having um, the loss of maryland and then the loss of virginia tech um you know sean being hurt um all of those things those factors came uh, made the season what it was towards the end which was a lot of question marks. There was week to week, a lot of question marks. And then going into the bowl game, whether Sean was going to play, how healthy Sean was. And Sean was manning up a lot uh, in terms of his condition. I'm not really sure. Uh, Sean's hand was 80%. Uh, I don't even know if it was 60%, but you couldn't tell um, with him because he was just really motoring through it and was going to move forward. Um, that was the kind of leader he was. Um, so uh, then he got partially hurt. Yeah, yeah, he got hurt in the, the Tennessee game, in the Sugar Bowl game as well, uh, with his hand as well. So he was trying. He was trying his best to will us through, and uh, I give him everything for that. Nicky, were, were you happier in the offseason? Because uh, you had played a lot. You, you had a tremendous year. Um, you know, I've, I, you know, obviously the, the season didn't end well as a team, but personally, it was a great year for you. Were you happier going into your to your fourth year, or were you still worried about playing time? I was still worried. I was still worried. I was happier. Um, um, I was, but I was still worried. Um, I, you know, I was still carrying around the Georgia Tech game on my shoulders um, and letting the team down. Um, wanted to make up for that. Uh, um, always did. And um, but at the same time, I was wondering what the fourth year would look like for me and um, how that was going to uh, work itself out. Yeah, well, it was a pretty tough start to the season because two of our t- the worst losses in school history, uh, you know, we ended up losing to both Georgia Tech and Maryland at the first two games. I mean, the season ended off ter- tremendously, uh, but uh, uh, mm-hmm. besides the bowl game loss, but we, we finished really strong. Uh, but what about those first those two first two losses that had to hurt to lose to Georgia Tech and Maryland again? Yeah, it was it was tough. It was uh, it was unbelievable. Um, those are those are kind of games that are uh, like a blur to me even to this day. After the games, um, I think the team was trying to find itself and in, in reflection. And um, overall, you know, we were kind of get our, trying to get our ground. Um, Matt 
was doing, uh, I think that was Matt Blunden at the time, uh, um, was doing a, a good job. He wound up, you know, finishing the season with no interceptions and, and you know, doing having a great uh, senior year. But, uh, yeah, it was very tough. I think our team was trying to find itself, um, you know, without Sean and without Herman, without a lot of the players that we had before. Yeah. Yeah, Matt Blunden had a historic year. I think he had 19 touchdowns and zero interceptions. Uh, did you see that coming? Because um, he, yeah. had, had he had he been available the year before uh, when Sean got hurt? Was Matt available or not? Yeah, he was. He was available. Um, you know, Matt at that point, and and talking about the athletes that we had at UVA and kind of the duplicity that there was all. You know, Matt was playing basketball as well. And at that point, he had decided strictly on football, so he went strictly on the football route. Um, and, you know, there was I, – I think that helped him a lot, just yeah. being strictly focused on football. Um, didn't see that coming. Didn't see the no interceptions. Didn't see the 19 touchdowns coming at all. Um, but knew he had a great head on his shoulders. Um, smart kid. Very tall. Uh, 6'7", I want to say. Um, very good athlete. Um, totally uh, – in, in terms of the way – the offense was ran different for sure. More Brady, him, Sean, more, <laughs> you know, Lamar yeah. Jackson. So, um, and uh, yeah, so it was totally a different offense. So we had to work around the changes that we had and feeling everything out. But once we, we got going, it was good. Yes. Yeah, matter of fact, we're probably one of the hottest teams in the country near the end of the season. We beat mm -hmm. NC, NC state was in the top 20, beat them on the road. And then mm -hmm. the last game of the year, we destroyed Tech. I think we beat them 38-0, which was great because they, they had beat us pretty badly the year before. Uh, and I, I think you had a touchdown run against Tech. Do you, do you remember those two, uh, those two big wins? Yeah, I definitely do. I remember both of them um, very well um, because they were they – were... yeah, you're right. We were on a roll. Um, it was it – was it was – things were going well. Everybody was jacked up. I, I remember even seeing Matt. Matt was kind of one of – at quarterback, he was one of those kids that never really got too excited. He was just one of the kind of – and seeing him, him jacked up at the end of the season on plays and just going, yeah, just pumping his fist and just getting into it. I remember that um, specifically. Uh, seeing him, you know, finally break out of his shell was good. Uh, and Virginia Tech game, which was my final uh, game, um, was probably one of my best games ever. I – I remember because of how excited I was and how easy it felt and some of the plays that um, that went down that, that I remember to this day, um, some long runs. So um, it was a great game. Yeah. Well, you know, it didn't end well. Um, Oklahoma, a very hot Oklahoma team. Uh, just the camera. Mm. Uh, uh, oh, there we go. Um, a very hot, a very hot Oklahoma team took it to us. Um uh, uh, there was a pretty big loss in the Gator Bowl. What, what, what about that Oklahoma team was so tough? Were we just not really prepared for them? Or it was, was it a, I knew it was a really talented team. Uh, what, are, what are your recollections of that game? Uh, they were big, they were fast, and they were strong. Um, <laughs> that's what I remember about them. Uh, they were, they were, they had athletes all over the place. Um, I went up uh, when I was drafted. One guy that was at for Oklahoma um, that became good friends when I at the Bears, and they were just they were just a big, strong, fast team. Um, and I don't know how getting over coming together, and we were having such a great um, great end of the season. I'm not sure how well we we were ready for that game. Um, they were they were really good. They were really good. good. This this has been great, man. I you're a name, a blast from the past, and you're one of those guys who had this, these incredible two years, and everyone was talking about you. And uh, you know the whole thing with Kirby, but the undefeated uh, season. You know you're involved in those in those in those great moments that we all remember. Tell us a little bit about your post uh, UVA journey. I, I know you know you got drafted for the with the Bears. Tell us about you know mm -hmm. the NF, your NFL. Um, uh, uh, Chase uh, for a spot, and also uh, what came next? Yeah, um, you know, once uh, 
the draft situation went to the combine uh, was involved in the combine uh and there were some projections of you know maybe third round maybe fourth round for me um in terms of being drafted there were some teams that were really looking at me um tampa was one um there was some other teams out in los angeles um rams at the time and it was for me it was just being ready so i it just really kind of worked really hard at making sure that i was ready for for the combine i was ready for the draft um when I went to the combine, though, however, they did find a heart murmur, which is really weird considering we have a situation that happened uh, a week ago. And I spent a good portion of my time at the Indianapolis hospital on monitors of my heart. Um, the heart murmur, I don't know if that impacted my draft status. Um, um, I, I want to say that I think it did because I did fall um, um, tremendously, but, um, you know, it was good to know, at least. Uh, I think at that point in time, there was a lot of things going on. There was, I remember there was another athlete that, a basketball athlete that fell um, uh, on the basketball court and died at that same time um, Hank, um, from a heart Hank, condition. Hank um, it's probably Hank Gathers. Hank Gathers? Yes, yes. Uh, yeah, yeah. So they were... I think the emphasis on heart conditions and stuff like that was really, really strong. Um, you had Lenny bias and all that stuff that was going on. And of course, it's totally, totally separate thing, but um, there was a lot of emphasis on that. And then Hank gathers um, falls. Um, uh, and, and so there, he did a lot of testing. Um, I spent a lot of time there. So I think my draft uh, went in that direction after that was found. Um, didn't tell anybody, didn't share with anybody. Um, none of the coaches back at UVA, no one. Um, I think my agent knew and we just moved forward. Uh, draft, uh, came, went to, was drafted by the bears and thought it, of it as a great opportunity because they did need running backs. Um, and, um, went there and had a great camp. Um, it was, uh, it was good for me and, that I got a lot of experience. I got to run the ball a lot, but um, they, were, they had a lot of injuries. They had a lot of old players um, from even the 85 Bears team that were still on the team. Uh, Dick was extremely loyal, um, but the the team was the older team. And and uh, so I was waived and then went to a, a couple other teams uh, uh, for tryouts. Detroit went to Tampa. Um, and those all kind of fizzled out, but I made, made some relationships when I was in Chicago with a host bear parent, um, all the, not all the rookies, but the drafted rookies would get bear parents as host. Um, and usually they're, you know, you know big donors, um, of the city. And mine was, uh, one of the founding fathers of cellular one. And so I got to talk to him a little bit. And when I got waived, I said, I don't know what I'm going to do. And he was like, well, you keep doing it until you, you, uh, you want to let it go. And then you give me a call. And so I did. And, uh, I, I got a job at cellular one and, uh, the rest is history from that point. That's the early days of the back phones and, and the, the big, um, uh, brick phones and stuff like that. And mm -hmm. I went into that business and that was the hot point. I asked him, I was like, what's this, what's the cell phone thing about? And he was like, well, evidently uh, I'm doing well in it. And he was, and uh, he lived in Lake Forest, Illinois. If, if you know about that zip code, sure. that is one of the richest zip codes in, in America. So uh, I uh, went into the business of the cellular phone business and was in, in that business for 25 years. Wow. And, and yeah. how'd you, and, and how'd you end up in Wilmington? Um, I was a marketing manager for U.S. Cellular um, and moved here and was uh, doing a lot of events, sponsorships, working with uh, different teams um, from East Tennessee State to East Carolina, um, worked with some with uh, UVA, worked some with Virginia Tech as a, a sponsorship manager um, and event manager. 
and for U.S. Cellular and um, uh, got engaged. And then um, there was a new convention center opening up and, and started working them as their event manager and, and directing stuff there. And um, bounced uh, from there, uh, met a client of ours and now work for a resort here in, in uh, Wrightsville Beach, um, a resort that's uh, on the coast of uh, North Carolina. I love it. Yeah, what's what's not to like? So, are you still are you still involved in football at all? <laughs> do, you, do you keep up with the game, or do, are you any involvement coaching or anything? Um, because I because I'm essentially running a restaurant, um, ninety percent uh, all, all the time, uh, uh, and I have a six year old daughter. It's hard for me um, to to uh, to go to games and stuff like that on Saturdays. But I do keep keep up with the game as much as I can. Um, and, uh, yeah, I, I love the game. I always will love the game, love what the game gave me um, and the teachings and all the people I got to meet. Um, as you said, they help with everything in life, uh, whether it was <laughs> you know, my education to race relations to the way I'm raising my daughter today. It, it it it's touched everything that I've done. So yeah, I keep up with the game as much as I can. Um, and because, uh, you know, running a restaurant, pool bar and, and, and all that is really a full-time job. <laughs> well, Nikki, this, this has been great. You got, you have an amazing journey. Um, you got a little bit of everything in there, you know, you know, a uh, middle-class kid from, from Martinsville that really, really did some great, great things in life. So this, I really enjoyed hearing your story. I really appreciate you coming on. You know, maybe one of these days, I, we do go to, my family and I, we go to Nags Head quite often because um, my, my okay. godfather's here. But maybe one of these days I can, we can get together, I can run into you in person. I'd love to have a beer with you or a coffee or whatever whatever you drink. Yeah, um, I'm a I'm a bourbon guy, so we'll have a bourbon. <laughs> that's, that's right. I, I got to be, I got to prepare for that. I got to hydrate that day to get ready for, get ready for that. <laughs> <laughs> love it. Love it. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, man, look, this has been great, man. I really, I really enjoyed this. I really appreciate you doing it. Yeah, thank you so much. I really appreciate it as well. Okay, great. Have